Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Dia's Readings in Contemporary Poetry series. Uh, my name is Megan Whitco, and I'm a curatorial associate here. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. Uh, the Readings in Contemporary Poetry series is something we reinstated in 2011 uh, in partnership with the series curator, Vincent Katz. And the monthly readings that we hold uh, highlight commonalities amongst different poets and hopefully help to bring their work into a larger conversation with one another. So it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome our two poets for the evening, David Shapiro and Angelo Mika Olin. I want to thank you both for agreeing to be a part of the series and uh, coming here tonight. I also want to send some warm thanks to Bill Berkson, who was unable to join us tonight, but I'm sure he would have been uh, an equally enthusiastic participant. Uh, we also want to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as their generous support helps make these evenings possible. And we also give a special thanks to the Brooklyn Brewery uh, for the complimentary cold beverages and our whole DIA staff who helps uh, bring these events together. So thank you to Blair and Claire, Sally, Patrick, and Max for helping to coordinate tonight. Uh, so just sort of the schedule events. Uh, after our first reader, we have a brief intermission before resuming with the second speaker of the evening. So it's now my pleasure to give a warm welcome to Vincent Katz, who's going to be introducing our first speaker tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Megan, and thank you all for coming tonight. And very excited about this reading and the two poets you have reading for you tonight. Um, of course, yet, as Megan said, our thoughts are with Bill. He's, um, you know, had, struggling through some difficulties, but we're hoping that he's going to come out great, as great as ever. And in his honor, I'd like to read two short poems of his from this series called Six Epigrams. So these are two poems by Bill Berkson. Among the crinolines, a champagne bubble from the 1950s in the air still. What that champagne felt, experienced, never forgot, deemed significant. When you cried, its other bubbles burst. And this one's called Plot. There's always a pretty girl in the plot, but nowadays she calls me sir. <laughs> and um, so I hope you will join us on our final reading of this year, which is going to be December 2nd. We're going to be having Paul Oster and Siri Hustvet, so please come back for that one. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Angelo Micah Olin. A native of Houston and a resident of New York, Angelo Micah Olin studied at Oxford and Cambridge but before receiving his BA and MFA degrees from Naropa University. He published several books under the name Jenny Olin, including a Valentine to Frank O'Hara, Blue Collar Holiday, The Pill Book, and Hold Tight, The Truck Darling Poems. His first book to be published under the name Angelo Micah Olin, The Hunger Notebook, is forthcoming from Tender Buttons Press in 2015. This feels like a homecoming. There should be a parade. Maybe there will be later. Angelo is the hero of a world a much larger world than you might imagine. One day, I predict, he will be recognized as one of our central poets. In the meantime, there is fun to be had. The fun started for readers in 1999 with the publication of Valentine to Frank O'Hara, a perfect Valentine to and simultaneous reaffirmation of O'Hara's aesthetic, the attitude evinced in the appropriation of and approximation to not only O'Hara, but Ashbury, Rivers, and Ginsburg, made it clear that this poet was taking a stance backed up by the poetic chops to see it through. Somehow, Olin is able to use O'Hara's language and phrases and still have it feel freshly invented. Quote, 
late noon light through the cartilage of some wife's ears at 4 p.m. in New York the day before Princess Diana died. Why, it was September then, end of quote. Somehow, too, Olin is able to affect heartbreak within a texture of carefully studied insouciance. It's in the pacing, if the wicked imagery doesn't throw a monkey wrench into the tone. Oh, wait a minute, the monkey wrench is the tone. As we move into Olin's truck darling period, the poems become denser, harsher, while still maintaining their stylistic energy, as though the poet is a martial artist, marshalling his savoir faire and compendious knowledge to simultaneously defend against and attack pernicious normality wherever it may lurk. Quote, nothing's more infuriating than mental luxury without a system. I sound like AM radio. Still, I'd rather be lush, melancholy, and tart than boring and pedantic, end of quote. Angelo is still in his punk phase, in which language gets twisted to reflect, I guess, the twistedness we all endure on a daily basis, living in the city, or worse, the suburbs, from which many of us have fled and at which still others have been horrified. It may be that Angelo will one day return to his Larry-hearted poetry, not that the poetry will be about Larry, although it could, but rather that an open-heartedness return. I feel that about Angelo, and I sense its return in his poetry. Whatever is to come, tonight we are here. Sound the trumpets, beat the drum. Welcome Angelo Micah Olin to Dia. Gosh, that was such a spine-meltingly tender intro. I don't, I hope I can live up to it. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you, Megan Vincent. Um, David, it's an honor. To, where are you, David? It's an honor to read with you. Um, and, and you, dears, oh, you could be anywhere in the world tonight, and you're here with us, and I awfully appreciate that. Uh, artist statement number one. I care deeply for child society. I am into grief, porn, and denim. Sensations of vertigo and disorder are sources of pleasure for me. I am interested in repossession of my soul. I know what doesn't work. I want my work to comfort brain-damaged kids and soul-sick adults. I hold no currency in the adult world, but no tenancy in the child one. If I were to choreograph movement to my heartbreak, it would be a flock of adults flying over me, wearing t-shirts that read, you are loved, relax, kiddo. <laughs> Grid and sensitivity for Jimmy Caston. Officer, this is art. I did it, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I want to belong to a warm boy gang. Recite Born Free. Step one, embodying Leonard Cohen in raiding rotisserie birds. The uncomfortable truth for purists is that blood was an aesthetic before it was anything else. Offering elbow pads for the vomitorium, this gentle murder comes as a prescription. Dispatch this note to our hero. This poem offers a guide on how to give flowers to different demographic groups, sexual aids found in nature, and a reading comprehension test. Wounded lyrically, every time I wake up, I am no longer single. Waist high in autumn pageantry, deer bells, and yellow highlighters. I've discovered the heavens in a moment of incarceration. I no longer lead the adorable altogether life, stored safely in styrofoam peanuts and bubble wrap. I pile up kidney stones and copy from memory the last page of Gender Outlaws. I show you all my dreams. You open your dark cabinet of meds in the Moonrise Kingdom. Our passion is soon to begin. Carried down river to wild orchids, I've lost control of this poem. It's a terrible love, and I'm walking in ivory. But if there is even a little bit of sunshine, I walk in it, as someone who always searches out the seasons with a loosened heart. Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw is a beautiful person. By beautiful, I mean communicating disease. As in the Pythagorean theorem swiped at by mud-covered tribes, the incident of my subtraction, Tom thought, white as Rauschenberg's supposed rudeness. Forget that night and your wet socks, low-flying engines. She'll never happen again. 
Did he jump Tom? Did he? And his fall in the southern hemisphere of towels gross raging the shits again. Febrile men wept, whacked out. I've got to go big distances. Well hung in snow white trash. The furniture was heavy failing also. Is this physics or ambivalence? No matter. Tom remains sequestered, loves them amid news of child abuse and lake effect snow. His news, a series of vibrations, their sadness and visions bring into relief. Beyond toe jams, landfills, caviar, the despondent correspondent pushing all those riotous gray sheep into a quiet form of media. This is called the touch system for my little brother William who says he can't be here tonight because he got a C minus in poetry. <laughs> Shrimping with you in a Spanish bed of paella, the veggies stir fried with a loaded pistol. I turn again, but your spicy heart just adjusts with raw, dirty power. For where your treasure chest heaves, there also breathes my sliced heart like sashimi. But there are countless things in the world for which affection is just not enough. Bloodshot with rad emotion, I'm conceptually sorry, but literally tragic, as fingers of pale light sprawl across the slumbering rooms of our great Asian divide. Tiny muscles of hope hurt, yawn. Someone is crying for us, and the chamber coursers have shut up. Our plasma is using up the dark amber of the world's stained pillows, your soft eyes the khaki of our moldy mattress. Like a rusty, soiled preteen almanac, we have WD-40 streaming down our chest. Ah, oh, hon, for the love of God, what do we try to unlock in us? Depakote. I felt most at home on this pill in a bucolic shire of the Hamptons, amid the piss-colored braids of wheat on a metamucil can, milkweed and sneeze drops. A track the loneliness of a middle distance runner, never checked out in the orangeade foam of dawn, glistening like a brow in an aspirin ad on the telly. I've got a brain like soaked coral. I've got a tongue like a baby's penis. I'm Bruce Willis in the sixth sense. I'm dead, but I don't know it. My pen, my Eskimo blood spilled cheekily over good and dear people. I managed to write this by myself with a little help from my friends. When I said, oh, get me away, I'm dying, I meant I wanted a cigarette and a problem child on a peony-filled evening. In the dry heat of photocopy fans making Easter cards with the uh, terminally ill, you hold the retinal scanner to my heart. Now I know how Joan of Arc felt as flames rose to her Roman nose and her hearing aid began to melt and in the darkened underpass I gave blood and now my French is shaky. Embracing Exile for Nigel Massey. Keel's vanishing cream doesn't help a mummified ego. I'm weary of saving my love for prayer poems. Ash Wednesday is pious, showy, and everyone secretly wants to wear a dirt suit at warp speed. I'm ashamed to tell my spiritual director I really wear a sackcloth wife beater from salise.co.uk. <laughs> Please keep curling me into an arthritic ball until I know their pain. I want a mountain of snowflakes to squat on me and turn my chest smurf blue. I want to be part of something bigger than myself. Not the Great Lakes, but the Commonwealth of Love but there is still this bardo of aridity. I never used to notice the tulips on Park Avenue. Tiny blades grew inside me. I used to score pills at the airport bar and take off, riddled with thorns and cereal puking. I'm not clear who took me to hell then, the one black rotten molar, the shrinkage of my childhood, the deficit of choral soundtracks. Now I celebrate the death of Jenny and your holy birthday each night standing nude in front of a mirror. This way I always keep night watch and you are covered. Come back to me. Remind me you never broke the lease of my abdominal shell. I drink a lot less Malbec now and can sleep each night. In my dreams, kids throw rotten eggs at me in darkened quarters. I am sad to see them go. Everybody leaves. That is heresy. Okay, well, it feels like everybody leaves. But this month you gave me lavender trees allowed a hummingbird in my bed, promised me a soft storm cloud for a grave someday. 
I've been at sea holding my head above water for years. It was navy, pearly, and exhausting. Now I see my own gift of darkness is bequeathed by God. My tender baptism slumped against the cool tile of a latrine, a poor kid's brand of salvation, eyes glazed like pond ice, in the unlicensed afternoon, I am a cannibal teething on a chip of your bone, tenderly tucked in my mouth. I am chased out of grief by a cherry motif air freshener, creamy dawn frosting my dirty window panes. City boy, fan out your limited expectations. The world is your Tabasco clam. Um, it's actually not dehydration, it's puberty, but... <laughs> Ho Chi Minh. I'll tell you what's great is the prison poems of Ho Chi Minh. Meanwhile, in Naval Observatory time, I felt right at home in your home, right alongside you. Your animal sincerity intrigued me. You made me feel like a battered spouse falling through cold cream with crushes on everyone against a snickering Prada landscape. I lay down my rod and staff comforted. I think you felt me rage in an easy, rosy world, and this appealed to your forensic instinct. If you stay still, I could begin to love the living, and among the dead, only you and your bloody wig tufting the Suffolk coast at night, but whatever. Blasting bone health insurance in the ripped bodice wing, I don't always seize the human pathetic moment, the fluctuating anguish of day-to-day, minute-to-minute living where you reign so transparent and in relief in my pantheon of failed crushes. I could make bark rubbings of your arterial tree. You could never leave me alone, and then you could. Aftermath for Todd Colby. Something ethical is moving me away from your beauty, for serious. You rage like swollen math and allergies in my brain. In my dreams, I am hatching the hot eggs of black oceanographers. The massive animal flu of love has run me down. I am running the temperature of a star in a ditch. I inherit other people's dreams when I'm crushed out on them. Are you so strong or is it the black Russian in me? Can I French you where it hurts one more time, this time with apathy? Sushied out and despairingly acoustic, you cannot bring sexy back without a receipt. <laughs> Hot little animal, hold tight. This is Hustler White for Jack Murray. Animal control said I'd probably drown to death. Cars driving off of the Fire Island Ferry fly toward the sun before they land, while tan cloud pudding and plank light slants of smog protect underage boys from the land cruisers on West Side Highway. On National Suicide Day, a dead teen lay in the ivy. I could be into necrophilia if the prize was brand and Tina, but time and the sun are against me, and that sucks. I spaz out because it's such a small thing to suffer. I wish I always had a shower head over me like a reverse umbrella. Tibetan throat singing awakens a husky lionine need to masturbate, burning my loins in medias race, like when someone drops a herd of french fries in my lap. My ribs can be cracked by champagne carbonation in the third quarter of the new year. Some teary savior couldn't mean it more, since even when scared, art is no dictionary. I don't need to get technical to get tax returns for being prodigal. Amid the swordfish and sewage of the Hudson River, God's breath activates humidifiers with a voice that exfoliates SRO wards, rinses any blood and hair that decorates a windshield in a car wash. Have you soaked your cortex in the juices of our Lord? Hope feels as slurpily puny and hedonistic as the little sliders at the frick. But my atoms are black caviar. I love only tricks and my art is sin. Don't send me flowers. My boyfriend, the infidel, is dying of old age, so I am praying to Virginia Woolf to soften his heart. <laughs> I had to kill a lot of impulses to get to him and his point of misery. A black cloud chased me with erotic intention then. My vanity drove me to the ends of the earth in search of nubile flesh, and my runny little heart slid back and forth along the glamour axis that is the river's divide an iffy affair flecked with grief. I fled to a Mexican isle just to lose my honky power, turn the faint and dirty mimograph red of nipples, 
Die on the line, if I recall, there was a bandaged harem somewhere in the background. Brownouts, sparklers, girls with organic breasts ducking through oyster fog. The subject of the mural was the apocalypse, and I think you handled the destruction of the world as gently as possible. Larry, I'm really bawling now, can't get through. We're both sticking to our guns, but I'm loaded, really bombed, shot up all night with the horrors, though my cousin, my gastroenterologist, says I'm fine inside. <laughs> and a kind of moral autism settles for Vincent Katz. On a catwalk, always lead with your heart. In a duet of arpeggios and trills, morose girls slumped against things, ineffable beauty, a flotilla of fanfare and smashed daylight, and Kate Moss's collarbone sticks up as reassuringly as a barf bag on a bumpy flight. I intercept many a thought heaven meant for another boy. I am as faithful as a seahorse or as Marianne. I am the hand of the Mona Lisa skirt. I tattoo a wall socket on my bicep just to feel alive. I feel sometimes I'm dying aesthetically, never mind morally, which is pretty suckful, like the dead French I once loved in textbooks on blonde executive paper, the starboard side of hope. It pained me awfully to accept their art in the Swabian line of violence as when a constellation passes over a last cardiologist. Hey, you got a minute for the whales, the seals, the trees? I feel in my bones a boy who wants to be beautiful. I feel a God who wants to love him, a puny loaf of light shining on my bad seed inner child, coating by the fistful and these little pastel pills like albino's pupils swish in my belly, light up my flickering world, and hook up with a connect the dots version of God, which is a rapist plowing still innocent through sunbathed fields of wheat. You can't throw out the saints of death, the saints coming up from a heat vent. Ow, like an emotional tennis elbow trespassing on a phantom arm. Do you have permission from the owner of this grief to even be here? Black petals of smoke and light fall on a kid's autumn trampoline. Tell the doctors not to jump up and down on me. My pants go wet, dark, I'm tiny, but Snoopy's penis is bigger than mine. After reaching puberty, a male whale produces more than 200 gallons of semen a day. Don't touch me, it hurts. I carry silence as a blood-filled egg. Your strength bores me. I cannot improve on silence. But Snoopy said the cutest thing. He said, I don't want you to die. And all I want is some sort of grace. And then the water pours from my eyes, antifreeze. I've taken out another six months on this body. I work quickly now, feel there's no time for bullshit. Half-used cassettes of Times Square sex talk. Fear of dying, anger's dreams, someone barking Cantonese. I'd like an upgrade to the Great Wall of China, a room with a better view. Yet America is such a beautiful country, don't you think so? Still, its perfume and garlic and pioneer cemeteries make me throw up. I pickle a jar for containing digestives and maybe joy. Confetti is at home in me, festive as lice. I don't want you to be here. I don't want you to be eaten like me. Remains eaten by angelfish and a star-stuffed child civilization, crappy snowflakes everywhere. But radiance is about pissing off the world. When you stop being radiant, you can be, you know, kind. <laughs> Colors, starting Patty, Grandma, and me at 25. Wherever you go, there you are, like Patty Smith's shoulders, placed in this cold century with a virility that lacks self-esteem. Paco says, hang on and flourish. Like Grandma Moses, I use her little legs and go to town, making scenes in which a dirty lover breaks down, blushing assailants in bra training films, my college heart sprain, harried and in sympathy with the damning empire. Guess I'll grow up to be as pink and mean as God, with spare ribs, a Dutch vocabulary lesson which makes my uncle see red, eyes closed to people's moorings, spoiling it, and a kid's liver gets smacked in on a jungle gym vibrates beneath a bright sexual state of the union address. Poor Paco, poor Jim Dine. Audit trails are here again and I have never smashed a black widow myself force fed horse meat out in the sticks or stark mad on the sidelines. Some brownies skip forward as in a fugue singing horses through with Orangina, headgear, the Hispanic child rack transmuted into nerves and glory and this, the ruinous work of nostalgia in my august opinion in a turgid march, 
or my dream of becoming alive on the turnpike, like a two-ton hussy the way I don't fall in at way stations, lighting the endless white race with elbows, limp systems my valentine, and Grandma Moses sweating in an infinitely soft asylum. Hunting accident for Larry Clark. You make me feel like I was dying in an iron lung and an angel dropped a ribbon-tied pony keg of nitrous on my chest on Valentine's Day. The accurate lust in your eyes will land us on page six, but I still will mount without saying sorry because I am not a twink. A ragged kid of science fuels my ink cartridge. On prom night, he toasts me, come on, patoots, don't make me go it alone. I'll go mad, mad, I tell you. Crowded in the clouds, I feel virile, like an alpha lemming shouting, next. Let me sign you into my elite hell and pin a pass to your nipple, your lunch money, as pubescence and heat tag each other in and out of algebra, gasping and symmetrical. Your uncle hates my skate rat bangs, that mark of suffering on a callous night against a heart that doesn't ice the lemmings out. I took the bullet meant for this, your phantom heart. You allied with the smoking Beretta, whatever. But I would die for you, not because I'm loyal, but because I don't mind. <laughs> Frozen funds. Bank statements are my suicide note. I'm making an expensive withdrawal from something more than you and mankind. I'd wanted to build very wonderful, safe poems sad people enjoy inhabiting is all. I wanted to give back what I stole, you know? My charley horse limbs plucked apart gently with salad prongs by a guardian angel. I arrive in menopausal bedclothes with a flock of sweat drops. Let's vote on the tremors of the children bearing frostbite. One of me's standing casually on a sandbar, a goose pimpled diver, or I'm dressed in a blizzard of sunbeams, a teacup of minnows at my hip. Men were just beautiful today, forget hell. Clover exploding in my chia pet heart. My freedom is beautiful. My heart adjusts to its new size, Ireland. Often navigational, a lazy night's hand holds me as I dance to the end of reedy love. But dwelling in a soft bank of snow, I might die this year, and I'm sort of okay with that. My fettuccine Alfredo looks like a green Play-Doh alien wig with semen in its hair. Should I take a selfie of my food? No, I'm too classy for that. But I'll nibble the stuffing of your discarded taxidermy dreams, a shaft darkening over the plains of my soul. Tuft of hair, fur chips on the road as a mimosa and fudge dusk hits them, holding their loss of body tenderly in the late sun's bosom because some of me lost some of you. The late moon smacks me on the bottom, shining, get up. A room without a roof, spiritual silverware to check one's teeth in. Here I stand, nude, ravaged, deprived. Oxygen is a personal food. God understands I cannot kneel or genuflect at all. I can, however, dance. And when I waltz in beauty like the night, I defy you. Could you not watch with me for one hour? For serious, the dispossessed inherit the earth. If you're not dispossessed, why make art? Creation seems so old and boring and not paintball. As long as I keep doing what I'm doing, dragging images in my head into the light, I'll be all right. I remember the first time the heavens moved, baby trapezoids and sun growth over and over again. The skate park does not know it is a heaven. The new, the free, the unconstructed work of God. You defeat me, I wanna live with you. You open the screen door, voluptuous in mourning. The concrete surfer in the Delft Blue Dawn carving streets is rude and sick. The city looks like it vomited shimmering cellophane and kids with birthmarks on their faces. One of the more punk things one can do is to be aggressively aligned. I put on my helmet, fall in love. Um, and this last poem will be for Diana Ricard. Artist statement two. All paint is war paint when you're newly stretched. Nude of grace, I want to be seen with dignity or not at all. A plumaria lay is the only noose the ethers will allow, fractional ownership of grief only. I take the candor of the animals as birthright, baby gear. It is five in the morning inside the heart, outside the constantly new darks. Pulsing with winks, I'm almost awake. 
Getting it together on a tract of peat marsh swamp, a trophy for atrophy at great speed. I will not award this momentum, nor tag this quote over. I have no energy for down below. Close to throbbing, I can still swim like this in the American tub. If you're still mining for hearts of gold, visit the expert, the exposed sleeve, with its apotheosis part sling. No matter how warped I see the world, it's my world, cracked and salty. Nude of grace, I paint it anyway. Thank you. David Shapiro is a poet, critic, and art historian. He has published numerous books of poetry and criticism, including A Man Holding an Acoustic Panel, Lateness, John Ashbery, An Introduction to the Poetry, House Blown Apart, After a Lost Original, A Burning Interior, and New and Selected Poems. I once heard David Shapiro commiserating with another poet saying, so-and-so is like Picasso or Brock. We're like Glaze. <laughs> there may be some truth to this comment in the sense that Shapiro's poetry, like Albert Glaze's painting, is of a high technical finish, and both occupy a position that is best appreciated by true aficionados of their respective art forms. Also, both were important as critics, a fascinating intertwined but ultimately separate endeavor. Shapiro's poetry, it seems to me, divides into two main categories, poems in deceptively simple sentences and psalm-like poems of incantation. His achievement is to wear his learning lightly, his knowledge of the vast terrain of English literature, not to mention French, etc., does not intrude on his ability to write simply and clearly, as in these lines from a poem published in 1972. Quote, and now the whole water is silver. A crucial step is taken, but years later, the fountain is slowed down, as if controlled by your calm hands." End of quote. It's quite remarkable how this student, in a figurative, if not a literal sense, of his predecessors, Koch, Ashbery, O'Hara, and Schuyler in the New York School, does not sound like any of them. If anything, Shapiro's poetry has similar pacing and use of language to that of his contemporaries, Tony Toll and Frank Lima. In all three cases, sentences wind their ways through poems with surprising, sometimes shocking turns along the way. In Shapiro's case, there's often a childlike delicacy that gives his work a faux surrealist air, which can take on a biblical tone, as in this passage, quote, you open your hand to show the five sheep sleeping safely under the tree which ladies wear around their necks, end of quote. Madness enters into Shapiro's poetry, sexual desire, and humor, but these elements do not disrupt the even intellectual tone. The reader never feels that the poet is out of control, and this can be a comforting experience amid all the world can throw at one. Shapiro's poetry, unlike much contemporary practice, refuses to mirror the world as much as it is of its fabric. Rather, his poetry provides a soothing balm, an effective tincture to temper life's challenges. But above all, it is his clear voice and music that entice us, and that is what we have the privilege of sharing tonight. Please help me welcome David Shapiro to Dia. Thank you. Thank you. Allen Ginsberg used to say, can you hear me? <laughs> You're like, so if someone can't hear. Ron Padgett once said, then let them listen more. Something. Anyway, um, you know, I'm really sad about ill poets. <laughs> I'm one of them. and. Um, so I, I wanted to dedicate something to Bill. The truth is that what, he's wonderful in many different ways. Some of you know his um, collaborations with Frank O'Hara. Also, he did little poems that are like little sculptures. So I was thinking of reading one of those. In truth, I'm sort of disappointed that nothing I read will be sufficient. 
The other part of Bill that I like is that he's very intelligent and he's, um, he's a very good art critic. And if you can get a hold of his art criticism, it's very modest, but very um, on target, as it were. Um, you know, every poet has thought that they're art critics, but it's not exactly true. It's, uh, I mean, you know. Kenneth Koch said of Meyer Shapiro, does he write good poetry too? And I said, not at all. And he said, thank you, God. <laughs> and um, it's, it's very hard to be a good art critic, to, to look at something and to say it. So here's a little poem by Bill. Call it Goofus. Foot still and nothing to go, or the Japanese see ghosts, each man in his own way walking. I go see an old friend become a new husband, a student girl draws something looks like wood. Her friends call it ugly. I buy it. She gives it to me. What's the difference? I see maple trees on Maple Avenue. Ravel, sit down, his arms like matchsticks. Know who I was? That fellow sitting here thinking minutes ago. Some of it seems, for, it was done in 8, 16, 68, you know? I mean, we always thought that we were creating revolutions, but you know, it's pretty good to change language. Um, so, one doesn't want to be like those poets who take a million years to get to where they're going. I'll read a poem that Philip Lopez said he read better than me. <laughs> when my mother died, I wanted to write the best poem that I could, though I really knew that what she loved were novels, and I was never able to write Sons and Lovers. First of all, it had been written. <laughs> It had been written. No, I mean, she had very good taste. But I feel sad that I wasn't able. I've written a few bad novels in my desk. This is called Lateness, Freda Shapiro, 1920-1975. The nerves are foolish. Invisibility induces offers. Tears streaming as if attached to some creed are mildly antiseptic due to salt content. Tears, secret and stainless, Precursors for the sound of your voice. People burst open and are released and release themselves, easily picked up in that wind, at the lower and rounded end of the heart. No man ever saw those forests of fern, but I see you in your bed as you floundered in a stream of air and light, blue and brown and black and hazel, the eye divested of tears like insignias with a blow. The lacrimal apparatus remains, and the bright room. We are separate now and move rapidly like tears. The legs from the knees are missing. And the arms are joined awkwardly to the body. A lion tears your hair, falling low at the back. The whole world would have been the pediment. The lion's mane has successive rows of flames. In your missing hand, you would have held the lion. My face, the epigram, is carved in large red letters above our holes, beat of the deceased, and traces are preserved of the wise and excellent doctor Aeneas. Doubt is represented, and traces of blue wine with nine carved petals. Leaves are falling in schematic folds. The tongue of a conquered hero protrudes slightly. The face is long with a battered surface. Inscriptions we engraved on our thighs. A leaf falls from your lips, and I am in love with my lot. Only the upper world is intoxicated. Color would have covered you. The scene itself comes from some original. The child extends his hand in an eager manner toward his mother, in his hand a puppet doll of the deceased. In the hole in her right breast would be wedged the spear of the victorious warrior. Only her head is preserved. It turns back in agony thus drowns back into the depth of the shrine. It is the work of a good sculptor. It is difficult to distinguish between the living and the dead. The deceased plays the piano. In the airy plains of the ocean, a rich throne which shows the need to heroize this woman unjustly dead. Eros touches her lightly with the palm of his left hand. The little refugee can scarcely stand on his feet. A young woman is leaning on her arm, which, stretched vertically, closes the composition. That was inspired by these wonderful things, though who cares what inspired it? 
But there are wonderful things in um, Athens of um, describing, you know, the following ruin was a woman now blasted off her. I mean, just amazing, <laughs> amazing things. And um, it's so great to read with someone so alive as Angelo. And um, once I was at a terrible opening at GoGo, -Go and I said um, t of someone, that's, that's very beautiful. And Larry said, no, let me show you beauty. He pointed, that was wonderful. So this is um, a poem. And the only thing I want to say about it is it's like all these poems that we used to do about learning languages, you know, and they're so beautiful, these stupid books. They're just so beautiful. So this is um, I Haven't, after see it or say it in Italian. Do you have a lion in your house? Do you have a serpent in your house? No, fortunately, I do not have a lion in my house. Do you have a woman leaning slightly past the spirals in your house? No, I do not have the edge of her dress in my house. Do you have a lion in your house? No. I do not have the outline of her body in my house. Do you have a trouvaille in your house? No, fortunately. I do not have a lion in my house. Do you have the goddess Hygieia headless as a house? No. I do not have her right hand casting a shadow on my house. Do you have a lion in your house? No. I do not have her light peplos folds full of life in my house. Do you have truth as the consequences in your house? No, fortunately. I do not have a lion in my house. What do you have in your high, heavy house? Do you have a rendering of her brilliant, pitiless hair falling on your house? Do you have a lion in your house? No, fortunately. I do not have a lion in my house. I did thousands of those. Thousands. On a given day, I can dream them, you know? It's like a villanelle. You know where it's going. You know where it's coming. but. But some people, now, Fred Dupuis said, um, a wonderful person who actually died of a terrible emphysema, but so he was always coughing, and he said, he didn't know whether I was saying lion or line. So I've been doing them with, where lion becomes lion, and towards the lion and up to the lion. Oh, this is from a book of learning New Testament Greek. It's wonderful, it has some pretty little pictures. Towards the lion and up to the lion. First you were too dazed to gaze into the lion, around the lion and with the lion. Hand over hand you were getting into the lion, sniffing palm trees and floating upon the lion, towards the lion and up to the lion. In the seventh frame you slipped above the lion, into the white sky beyond each lion, around the lion and with the lion, now under the lion, smiling under the lion. It's a light green day, it is toward the lion, towards the lion, and up to the lion. But how is one to get out of the lion? One's hat and stick sticking out of the lion, around the lion and with the lion. You ran away from the lion and away from the lion, amazed and apart, days away from the lion, towards the lion, and up to the lion, around the lion, and with the lion. That's New Testament Greek. <laughs> And if you want to be a language poet, you can just change it to towards the line and up to the line. First you were too dazed to gaze into the line, around the line and with the line. <laughs> hand over hand, you were getting into the line. Line, sniffing palm trees and floating up upon the line, towards the line and up to the line. In the seventh frame, you slipped above the line, etc. OK. <laughs> Actually, um, John Ashbury once said to me, are you telling people that I write from the dictionary? I said, no, but I do. And sometimes when I'm very, so this was from Roji's Thesaurus, has a beautiful thing where it just, I like the fact that they have no reason. They're pretty empty, the, the reasons for what follows, what follows. So I, I wrote this thing. It, in the Roger's Thesaurus, it says, sta, 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 sta. So I wrote this love poem. Stay, 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 stay. It is snowing on the kindergarten. It is snowing on your eyelids. Love's dice are manias and fights. Anacreon writes, you are standing on my eyelids, and your hair is in my hair, as Paul Eluard says elsewhere. And what do you say? I say, stay, 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 streak intrinsicality. You know, I wouldn't necessarily have come up with streak intrinsicality, but anyway, we're not teaching poetry, are we? So. <laughs> A lot of
homes. My son didn't want to come today. I said, that's fine. In my family, we always say, it's just, you know, you don't have to come. So that's why my wife isn't here. My son isn't here. And a lot of thousands of people <laughs> might gave us permission not to, come, not to come. You know, sometimes people follow that permission, permission. So my son, my son, when he was about four, was a very good poet. And he, when he got angry with me, he said, are you the boss of God? You are the boss of God. And I said, that's good. Let's go upstairs. He said, nobody is the boss of God. Not me, not you. Are the angels the boss of God? I said, this is fantastic. Let's just go upstairs and put it down. <laughs> are you more famous than angels? I said, that is really good. He didn't quite. <laughs> are you more famous than angels? God orders himself to do what he wants. I am the boss of this poem. By that time, we were upstairs. He said, I am the boss of the poem. I was thinking about titles. He said, I wrote it. And the title is The Boss Poem. And the old communist, Howard Faust, said, said, boy, I don't believe in God, but if I did, that's my belief. What did they pay you for that? And, and Daniel said, my father doesn't pay me. And he said, never write except for payment. <laughs> so I began to say that. And Daniel would say, I don't want to write now. And I'd say, here's a dollar. And he would say, the wind was blowing around Daffy Duck. <laughs> the wind was. I just read something that said we shouldn't write except for money, and I'll tell you, that would be the end of my life if, if I had chosen that particular door. Um, here's something for, for Daniel, though it's a lot more serious. It says, um, King Oedipus has one eye too many, perhaps, Hildrelin. He used to hug him. He said, I love you so much. I'm going to let you kill me. Pathos, your thin arms, your neck, your hair rich without perfume, and your eyes bright as a brooch. You say you will kill me tomorrow, and I believe you. But for now, you must sleep in my arms like a cheat at cards. Five years we have lived together, counting like the Chinese. I fear every narrow road on which we will eventually meet. But do not banish me so fast, my son. Your club foot that I have pierced is more beautiful to me than your mother's breast. And someone, someone not here, though, said, is Lindsay going to see that, where you say that you like him more than I? I said, yeah, she'll probably see it. You know. <laughs> see all the things you can't get away with. But. And this is a, from a dream. Joanna Furman has a beautiful idea of a book and a reading, as it were, only of dreams. And I spent a lot of time, I was very jealous of, of you may not know him, of um, Bill Zavatsky, who would show me that the last dream he had was about 10 pages typed. And I thought, I never have 10 page poems, maybe one page. And even that, you know, it's sort of like Freud. But that night, I had a 10 page poem, but I'm not going to read it to you. And this is like a one page poem, House of the Secret. I met the old dead poet and told him I no longer loved my work as I had when a child or even 15. Sorry. I had not written someone else's poem, but it was already written. He told me, never think of others or of yourself. Never do anything for others or for yourself. And never write poetry for another or for yourself or yourselves. The secret hangs from the top like a prayer on a branch. It's the house of secrets narrowing to the last story. Or the house of the secret, singular, and I wept wondering where he had concealed such bitter sense. The camera was hidden under the floor like a boat. The poem hung from the branch above the silver bridge, criticism that does not end even in paradise. We think it is a bridge because it is silver. It is not a bridge. Lost is lost. One of my best friends, John Haydick, loved to say, David, lost is lost. And he thought that that was the height of a certain kind of Jewish wisdom. But he was, he was Catholic. <laughs> and that poem was one of those, yeah, I think Kenneth was in it giving me good advice. And other people were giving me advice. And um, so I'm not taking too much time between poems. My favorite, one of my favorite eyes in America was Rudy Burkhart. I said to him, how are you so good both at this and that and this and that? He said, I try not to exaggerate, David. I thought that was so smart. And we should try not to exaggerate. Um, but I do exaggerate, I guess. Um, so here's a poem that I wrote for him. 
and so the snow fell and covered up poetry. And so the snow fell and covered up cities like bags of leaves. And so the snow fell and covered up an architecture. And so the snow fell and covered one red-orange sexual flower. And so the snow fell and covered the bus and the passengers. And so the snow fell and covered up our friend. And so the snow fell and covered his clear water towers, his windows, his door. And so the snow fell and covered up the word poetry. And so the snow fell and covered up the snow and a house within. And so the snow fell and fell on his fallen trees. And oh, the snow fell and covered up his photographs of snow. And so the snow fell and covered up even passing clouds. Uh, one of my great friends, who's also not here, was Joe Cherivalo. My father loved and hated his work, particularly the, the poem that started, Oak, Oak. <laughs> my father would go around sometimes and say, Oak, Oak. He loved that. It turns out it's a classic, great, wonderful poem. It just happens that sometimes when you're drunk, you might say, Oak, Oak. It's called Drunk in Winter. I won't read it all to you at all, but um, a poem that I wrote for, I had a lot of poems written for um, Joe, and this was inspired by him. It's called Winter Work, because it, at bar they said, we're doing our summer work now. I said, what do you call your other work? And they said, our winter work. I said, what's the difference? Well, in summer, we work with others, and in winter, we work by ourselves. I said, all that I do is winter work. So, <laughs> So I wrote winter work for Joe. A dog prays for me. He barks inside all day what little there is, like a pigeon. Help! He kneels for his king one night. Kind owner, Ayeka, all is kind, all is cruel. A dog's prayed, obeyed, spayed. In the forest now, he moans for help in some of his languages. No one. The addressee slips away. But a dog thinks. The dog thanks you in the desert. In the desert of the desert, you have left a trace. That's a little poem for Joe. And then I think this is the time when I'm supposed to read new poems. I have a lot of friends who are always saying, have you written any new poems? You know, it makes me feel very guilty. Like, no, I've been making bad collages. I mean, it's really, <laughs> really terrible. Um, I would say to my father that I was resting, he said, you'll rest when you're dead. <laughs> but John Haydick, a Catholic, said, David, that may not be true. <laughs> <laughs> That's always scared me a little bit. <laughs> Somebody thought that my best poems were written when I was 14 or 15 or 13. And to me, it was very big when John Ashbery said, you're the best 13-year-old poet alive. But I was 15, and I was very angry. I was very angry. And I met this guy, Ramin, remember him, Oscar Williams, who didn't give me a prize in the Scholastic Competition Awards. And I said, look at this. And he said, come to my penthouse tomorrow. And after I showed him something, he said, rhyme it up. Rhyme it up. Like my friend Dylan Thomas, he rhymes it up. So that day, I wrote something with a lot of rhymes. You know, like, so I'll just read one of them to show you that I was not as good when I was a child. I was on a white coast once. My father was with me on his head. I said, Father, Father, I can't fall down. I was born for the sun and the moon. I looked at the clouds, and all the clouds were mounting. My friends made a blue ring. Oh, we hung down with the birds. I loved the snow when the summer ran away. Once I said, Cricket, cricket, aren't you afraid? that you're really too loud? He said, David, I don't think so. <laughs> Monstrous night, I want light now, now. This is a little exaggerated, would be said. I want light now, now. I want those great stars again. I want to know why I keep asking my father what he's doing on that shore. What is he doing anyway? Why isn't he over here? I saw the red bird too, but where's its wing? I want to tell my father what I saw. That bird is full of fear. I was in love with Theodore Retke, and Kenneth Koch said, you'll find out one day it's just me, John, me, John, and Frank. 
And I said, but what about Martin Buber? He said, what about a minor Jewish theologian? I said, well, sometimes it's good to be a minor Jewish theologian rather than... We talked about that a lot. And that day became very important to me. In, in August 1962, I was looking at something that said, you know, were there collisions, communications on the shore? Things by John Ashbery, I thought, oh, this reminds me of that guy, Rauschenberg. Yeah, yeah. It was like I moved up, glove the field. I must say, I suddenly she left the room, oval tear, tonelessly fell. I thought it was just amazing. I said, but he's using words as if every word was, was just any other word in the dictionary. I thought, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to read a few new poems, and that's it. You can see I haven't dried up completely. There is a poem written when I was 14. No. This is poem in a dream. I would like to comb the haiku from your hair, vertical braid of language, necklace of words, pinprick of a single sound. I work in black and white much more than you thought. As I work blindly, today is today, these geese. I'm a poet, only a poet, and I am no better than any other poet, and no poet is better than me. Remember architecture? No client, no commission, no sight? Oh, it's just an idea. Night enters the spiral. That's because once I was in, uh, John was giving a lecture at MIT, and he said, come with me, David. And he started by saying, I have, ripped off, I have ripped off my friend David. I just want to apologize to him. But the head of MIT said, so what is he doing with this? And I said, well, you know John. He's always building. And he said, does he have a client? And I said, no. He said, does he have a place for it? I said, no, you know John. And he said, oh, it's just an idea. <laughs> so here's something recently translated into Spanish, which I sort of like for Caminos, two ways. There are two ways of writing on the earth, with an ending or without an end. If with an end, try not to end with oceans. Without an end, without an ending, is a poet's delight. You don't carry a sink while walking in the street, do you? Fly past me on a lane that doesn't exist. I saw John Dewey waffling through the night. He said that poetry was not about. It was a starless night. No, there was a star. Some say it's mold, carve, assemble, or sign. No volcano is inactive completely, friends say. And there is the critic with a handle for a pot and the young title rising to the roof. What made you think that love was all about? And worse, it doesn't mean about, about. There are two ways of loving on the earth. I fail to look far out or deeply in. You are either one who has lost everything or who is going to lose everything. I saw books roiling in the night like laundry. It was a new library without a book. Splitters or lumpers, now you know what I am. This is too horrible, a dream of everybody dead coming back to visit me. Don't. <laughs> Even on Halloween, I just don't want to deal with it. Um, here's a forgetting a dream. I like to remember up to 16 lines in a dream I can deal with. But this is called forgetting a dream. Dedication to come. Forget the dream. Forget the poetry received in a dream. Forget New York. Forget language. Forget you love vile and electric storms. Forget the slit open opened. Forget a closed cloud, bread and lips. Forget David Shapiro. Forget yourself. Buy and sell yourself. Forget the great globe itself. Forget the angels in Silesia. Forget provisions for the trip. Forget that face. Forget eight arms for power. Forget peace. Forget restless form. Forget whether it was an actor or a butcher or a trader at night. Forget whether it was an interpretation or amelioration. Forget. Forget. You know, it's influenced by Provide, Provide, by a very nasty poem by Robert Frost. So nasty. Here I saw Andy in a dream. I saw Andy Warhol walking into our little park, Hudson Park. They've, they've been repairing Henry Hudson on top, looking like a wrapped stout Balboa. When, with all that ice and dying because some sailors get too cold, Andy didn't look like anyone else, but he was smoking an extremely long and tuneful cigar. I was going to tell him I had never seen him with a cigar before. His guts were hanging vividly out with scars by Alice Neal. He leaned back and murmured, David, that remark about 50 minutes was not me. 
maybe a little Eve, a little Reed, nor the, nor the plain food was I fond. Everyone helped out, like gilding the studio to make it seem by me, the robot. And never the philosophers. They were worse than the poets. How could I help it if they didn't know anything? Like a little fever in Greece, birds pecking at the immensely unreal grapes. They were painted, and now you answer the question, what would you come back, I said in heiress. But you say you don't want to come back. Oh, that's the best. I'll have to tell that to Ivan. Best not to be born. Second best to return quickly. He paused to photograph me. I said, all those Polaroids look like an Andy, Andy. He paused to sign the photo I had taken. I, I wouldn't let you. I stopped. I stopped you, and you said, are you posing with that deadly intelligence? Or somehow, it was Andy. He had, he had asked me one day, he said, what would you like to come back as? And I didn't quite understand. He said, I want to come back as an heiress, he said. And I said, well, best not to come back at all. He said, oh, that's good, that's good. I'll tell that to Ivan, Ivan Corr. Here's a poem that became poem for a day, thus giving me 15 minutes of poem for you. I am jealous of the sand beneath you, around you, what you see, bright things, gagged lady, sparkling and traveling without luggage, liquidity before X. You are tattooed on my back. Music dies down. I too grew up in the soft hands of the gods, and a little donkey will lead them. Tears, tears, and I know just what they mean. Honeysuckles at night. I wrote this poem for you and haven't lost it. That's because I always lose things, so my wife, I thought, should have a poem where I don't lose it. And now, since Ron is here and he loves perfect things, and this is partly by him, I took a poem that Ron had written that said, nothing in that drawer, nothing in that drawer, nothing in that drawer, nothing in that drawer. But it was all falling out, no. So I wrote 14 poems, but we finally boiled it down to one. There was something in that drawer. There was Buster Keaton attacked by the US military in that drawer. There was a blind chrysanthemum in that drawer. There was your body full as a burden basket in that drawer. There was my sister sleeping through World War II in that drawer. There was a quarter size violin and a full size in ruins in that drawer. There was an almost inexhaustible poem inside the poem in that drawer. There was broken neon geometry in that drawer. There was a gangster teaching Borges to speak English in that drawer. There was a feathery paradise and cities at your feet in that drawer. There were four Cambodian dancers attacked by blue butterflies in that drawer. There was my life at my fingertips in that drawer. All of Indochina gathered to be possessed in that drawer. There was something in that drawer. Thank you.